we're good to go. Yeah, See, that's I'm good. Used to being uh, interviewing the other person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we could do that too. I was only after free therapy, so I mean. Uh, I, I'll give you free therapy. Right on. So that'll be my. Uh, you, oh, the uh, subject matter right now, uh, I I think is uh, pandemic. Okay. Effects in the community. Um, I, I like to think everything's rosy. <laughs> I, I'm like that. I, I try to paint the, the nicest picture I can paint of any set of circumstances. And uh, it's a personal thing, you know, it's some feeling I need or something. But um, but I believe, here I am painting the picture again, but I actually believe that the majority of people have been amazing. Well, let, let, don't tell me now. Okay. Are we recording? I think you are, aren't you? No. Oh, hit, hit the old dot. Okay, so what you can do for me is... Now it's a red square, so yeah. I'm, I'm assuming... Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we and go. I'm, recording. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> How come you got a better picture than me? All right, all right. <laughs> Are you looking good? Yeah, I'm not. not well, that, that's kind of out of the question, but... <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Um, that's never out of the question. You're a handsome see, guy. Well, you know what? I mean, it feels funny at 63 to be still doing my best James Dean, you know, making him laugh at the counter and all that stuff that you do. Men do their, their best, you know, if you make them laugh at the counter, then you walk away with that feeling you still got it, you know, that kind of thing. And women, they have this thing where, where they don't leave the house in the morning unless their hair is right. And their version of that is if they catch the guy's eye, not in a nefarious way, just, you know. Yeah, catch, catch an eye. They still got it, you know, like that. So that's, I discussed that with my ex-wife, Tina, because she was a lot like that. And... Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's for whatever that's worth. So I think I still got it, you know. <laughs> it's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So let me just adjust this down a little bit. There we go. Oh, yeah, Much better. Good. Cool. So um, you want to talk about the pandemic? Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview today. Number one, Georgina speaks is my, the name of my podcast, and. I don't even know uh, what format I'm going to follow, to be honest with you. I'm just going to fly by the seat of my pants like I have for, forever. You're a folk singer who goes from <laughs> his heart. <laughs> Pretty much. I was yeah. describing you to my uh, daughter-in-law earlier before you came. I said, he's just an interesting guy. He's kind of self-made, didn't come up the easy way. And uh, he admires uh, Bob Dylan. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, who was had a lot of uh, political... Uh, folk songs behind him and that that was his thing and I said this guy's the next chapter Bob Dylan I don't know how he did it but from a young age a really young age he just knew how not to buy into Crap. get involved in let anybody own him pigeonhole him when he was the crown prince of folk and he showed up for the folk festival in uh, the big one in the States, They're the biggest one they have every year, with all along the watchtower with electric guitars. They booed him off stage. And he went off stage and he came back on with his acoustic guitar and he played the song that he had written, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. And if you listen to that whole song, it's him telling that whole gang. And it's yeah, like the, uh, you understand your orphan with his gun, like that's, he just was telling them, you know, time was up, and uh, and he just went on, he went on. He was with uh, Robbie Robertson. He, he asked Robbie Robertson and the band, they wanted to go touring with him. And Robbie Robertson was going, okay, and then he was playing all his new stuff. And Robertson was thinking, well, maybe he'll play a folk song once in a while, you know, get us, because he, so yeah. he had so much notoriety already. <laughs> and Robbie Robertson said, I, I have no idea how he knew, but people were just saying, you should be... You should be playing your old stuff. And he kept telling them, no, this is my music. And no, I'm, he was speaking truth with his old stuff. That's it. Yeah, and uh, and his new music was electric. It's what he wanted to do, and he's been famous. So I was telling my daughter-in-law. Yeah, so sorry, you, I'm just, I, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll babble all day. You remind me of that, in that uh, you have your views, you have your opinions. Uh, we don't always align on all of them. Yeah, of course. Uh, but I've said he's always um, stated them respectfully, and he's heard contrary views, re uh, views respectfully. Yeah. And so I like him, <laughs> and his music reflects those views as well. They're often very political, and talking about uh, 
uh, true difficult issues, things that are difficult conversations. Yeah. And um, I like that about you. I yeah, well, that. that's funny you should say that because you're, you're like at the opposite end of the spectrum of anybody I would chum up with in my lifetime. And when you when I was first reading your stuff, I thought you were full of shit to tell you the truth, uh, because uh, <coughs> because you you had a I I'm I'm I I just grew up with a big chip on my shoulder for people that talk a certain way or yep. authority or whatever. And you're and you're, but you are an authority on what it is that you're speaking, and you qualify it all the time. And you, so it took me a while, and then I realized, no, no this this guy's actually real. He uh, and so same same thing. Hey, eh? like I. First, I'm thinking, who the hell is this guy? Anyway, you know, and then, uh, and then as I read on, it was just like I, I could tell it was from where you come. Yeah. Yeah. And it means as much to you. Totally. As totally. my whatever I'm. <clears throat> yeah. Summer. Exact same thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it was nice to realize it in the end. So. So that's so. Um, I, I was thinking that today we should talk about the pandemic, the community, yeah. the. Uh, huh, I, I interviewed a. Um, Kevin Hutchins on the Hutchins Farm yesterday. Okay. It was a really good interview. About I don't it. know the fellow. So. No, so uh, he actually Scott Davidson uh, referred him to me because he grew up with him and they, mm. good. Scott's a really good guy. So he, um, the trials and tribulations that the farmers are going through is just horrendous. Like in terms of the, there's lots of government grants that are going to come available to help level everything all out so that everybody can get out the other end. Yep. Without, but <coughs> like just. I don't know that anyone's getting out the other end totally unscathed. No, of course not. But, I, but I finally got to hug my kids, my grandkids again, so that was a biggie. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, it was very nice. After three months of hanging out with them every day all the time, because I just did. I had time to. I would always go there, and me and Blue would just, you know, stir it up somehow. We were missing our grandkids. They're here. They're up here now. We're we're that bubble. Well, when you when you uh, posted the other day about grandkids just making shy. There, there, I'm going through that I right know. now. It, exactly. It took our um, our granddaughter, who will be one in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. So we hadn't seen her in two, three months. Yeah. And then we started seeing her regularly on Fridays. It took five Fridays before she would just put her arms out. Yeah. And, and want to naturally come. And, you know, welcome to COVID. Yeah. A lot of grandparents... Are going to feel hurt by that and longing and so yeah. you know i'm messaging people through my facebook page and connect on georgina just be patient oh yeah and, and it, it's, it's so, hard it's but it's so it, hard but just just be patient you know what Let i tell them, them come to you you don't want to overwhelm them no i've been telling them i i i really bolster my my grandkids as much as i can and i tell them you know what you two kids are like the smartest on the face of the earth because you know you're learning about this you know this is uh like relax your parents are doing really well we'll be together again hugging and kissing and don't worry about it you know it's all good how old are yours well blue's five and uh, madeline's three so they're uh, she's toddling around and she's <laughs> I've, I've she hasn't got to that stage yet where they actually learn full out that the whole world's not here for them Oh right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that's not all. I hate it when a kid reaches that. Sixty four, still working on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no kidding, eh? Exactly. And uh, and blue, I, I remember when blue went through it. I mean, it, it's a devastating thing for a kid when you think about it. In the, in terms of your, I know, it's not all about them. Yeah, yeah. The whole world's not there for them. This world is actually here for everybody else around, but they don't know because they're just that's their right. whole. And we do cater to them. At yeah, we make it their whole world. We have to. Yeah, like that's what you do when they're babies. And so they take them up. And then they get to that stage where you got to tell them, you know, okay, it's time for you to, I got some bad news for you here. You're just going to have to take it, eh? Yeah. Yeah, and they... Wait uh, your turn. Patience. Uh, share. Yeah, yeah, share. And I got to say, uh, my the, those two, their parents are pretty good. <laughs> About the last thing, I'm old school, man. I'm telling you right now, kids are to be seen and not heard. And... You know all of that stuff, and uh, I grew up with it. And I, I was, I love my kids, but I was, I was that way, the same as my dad was, you know. And uh, and more parenting from a distance. Yeah, of course, I love and parenting from a distance. And I, I, I don't want to talk a lot about it, but I, when they were growing up, this is a, a really amazing part of my story. But when they were growing up, 
I couldn't, I, I was incapable of feeling anything because of what I'd come yeah. through. Yeah. Well, actually, when they were growing up, the, I just knew they loved me unconditionally. And and their mother, I don't know how she knew that I was, she always knew I wasn't a bad guy, you know, like whatever my issues were and whatever my dark side was that I, that harbored there. Somehow she knew. And that love in the house, I couldn't feel any of it internally. But I, I knew I was a safe place there. And uh, so they, they got me through eh? And uh, I don't know. I, I think I was because I, I um, my upbringing. Oddly enough, it sounds funny, but uh, uh, all the abuse I went through growing up, my upbringing, my, my dad was a full-blown alcoholic his whole life, drove truck, but he, he was functional <coughs> yep. to, for the most part. We and my mother, you know, hang on, sorry. Yeah, we call it functional. Yeah, that is such a myth. Well, I know that, but uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's because because on an emotional level, you are anything but functional. Well, you know what? I feel bad now thinking about it for my dad because he'd go on a bender for like three months later in life, when the kids were all raised and he was just him and mom. He would go on a bender. He would go park in my brother's garage somewhere and make a bed and make a bed, and he would be there. Wow. My uncle had a barn. He went up and made a little room at the end of it there, like for an entire six months. Till his pogey ran out, then he would go find a job somewhere again, and then he would get functional again. Functional. Well, but so. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I, 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 I gotta stop you. Well, functional, when I say functional, I mean. But none of that is functional. Lot. And and here's why. Oh, I know we look, that. We look at one side of the coin and say, yeah. this is the alcoholism, and look at the other side of the coin and say, oh, this is functional. It's all part of the same coin. Yeah, well, of course it it's is. It's all the same coins, and it's not a good coin. Why? Well, hey. All in all. So we got to help the whole coin. My, my dad, I got to tell you, he, you know, every weekend for our entire life, whatever, like our entire life, there was there was always the elephant in the room. Yeah. Uh, absolutely the elephant in the room. And I love my father. He was a good guy. And uh, he did a lot of really neat things in his lifetime, like for us. But he was an alcoholic. And, uh, but my, and my mother, like when she was 70, was still pointing back to the time when he was going to go grab a case of beer and took my brother to get a haircut instead. As proof he wasn't an alcoholic. Mm. Yeah, I mean, well, I know that I generation know. never said alcoholic either, though. Right, but e even a watch, yeah, that doesn't work, is right twice a day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, yeah. 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 So. So. 100%. So you can no, the watch works. Yeah. No, it doesn't. No. And no. <laughs> I know you can point to certain circumstances. They turned out well. I, I have. Thank uh, goodness for those. I yeah. call them islands. Yeah, yeah. I call them islands. And, you know, when I'm working with people, I'm helping them build more islands until hopefully the islands connect. Yeah. And now we have a, a new land mass, Yeah, yeah, so we have a landmass we can actually <coughs> walk across without line, uh, without landmines in it, you know, yeah. Oh, no, I know. I mean, I have no delusions about my father being functional or not. He, but it's funny, like, I have that need to shut my brain off once a week. He was extremely, he must have been extremely uncomfortable in his own skin. Mm. for whatever reasons and but yeah he was born in 1919 so anybody who come up in those days I wrote I did a I did a book one time not a book a pamphlet uh, eight page called the seniors diary and in and in 92 when I was got into recovery I you know me I just got to get into something okay if I'm getting into it I'm getting into it so I got into it and then I would start uh, running into people that uh, advocate for seniors seniors recovery in those days was different than seniors recovery today because seniors i mean the uh, our generation we on the rooftop screaming i'm an alcoholic if that's what it took to get the job done that generation you did not talk about that they white knuckled it so i wrote a story about recovery for seniors being a shame-based recovery in other words they you know if you don't want to talk about it then then fine we'll let that go but yeah, yeah. And they would white knuckle it, and they would get through it. And it was about caregivers in, in the residences, bringing booze for them, and everybody thought, oh, this is, you know, why not? This is their last years, and so on. And so some, a lot of people lost the last years of their life drinking when they could have got help at 60 and had a wonderful 60s that and 70s. That goes on, by the way. Yeah. My wife and I, we were uh, volunteering at a senior's residence where we were living in Dundas. Yeah. Uh, we would bring our dog in, therapy yeah. dog, we'd bring him in once a week. Yeah. And so we've met hundreds and hundreds of seniors in the residence over the seven years we did that. Sure. And we certainly did see those circumstances where the caregiver, the loved one, the spouse, whatever, would continue to bring in alcohol uh, right to the, the very last day. And in, 
you know, you're right. They say, well, you know, they've done it this long, why not? You know, the flip side is it did rob some of the opportunity yep. to connect in a more meaningful way and have their am amends with their family. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I don't say that judgmentally. It's There will be different strokes for different folks. Um, you know, my dad... I, I, I'm just queuing into what you're saying. Yeah, no, I get it 100%. <coughs> and, uh, and my dad, for example, the day he found out he had cancer, he sat my mother down that night, said it's been a good run, no regrets, blah, blah, blah. Like, You've been a great wife. I gotta stop talking. I'll tear up here. But um, yeah, I mean, he he had a he was a class act. Like he he knew when to step up. My dad. Uh, that's old school stuff, you know. And uh, uh, and he. Uh, but just when it come to the booze, it was like a hard. It owned him. It owned him like his whole life. Actually, it owned him his whole life, and uh, and that whole generation. Actually, I should say after the war. Because all his cousins, um, there were farmers in their bottles hidden in the silos and different things, and uh, it was a pretty normal thing. You had to be quite a bad actor before you get noticed back in them days, I'll tell you. Like, uh, when it come to drinking, like they, everybody would make excuses for anybody, like just rather than look at anything, you know. You know, I, uh, here we are in Georgina. My yeah. parents bought a cottage in 1956. Oh, yeah. So I've been coming here the entirety of my life, and I remember the fellow who used to cut our lawn. Yeah. Is he a heavy drinker? Yeah. And uh, that that comment about making excuses for people and yeah. just kind of going along with it, um, that resonates with me because I remember that from my own childhood with with you know some of the folks uh, that I would be meeting in the summertime up here. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, he was such a nice guy. We'd sit on the front steps. I'd be three or four or five. He'd be with his beer bottle, and I'd be with my glass of apple juice. <laughs> yeah, sitting there. <coughs> you're, you're chewing the fat. Some yeah. Memories, yeah, as yeah. well as, yeah, but that was a problem. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, eh? <coughs> so I did, uh, what I did is I wrote that article. I, I was in touch with people at the, um, uh, there's a Dr. Jasek. He was out of Alberta at one point, and he came back to Toronto. This is back in the 90s. He was the foremost authority in Canada on seniors' alcoholism. Okay. Sent it to him, the article I wrote. And he sent it back right on the money, Tim. Like, yeah, that's exactly right. And I, and I wrote just about that whole uh, scenario. So I I published it in this eight-page thing called The Senior's Diary. And I got on the phone and I started telephone canvassing to sell advertising to get enough to pay just to produce it. And I did. And I got someone to do the artwork. <laughs> this is what I love about you. You're doing the same thing now in the technology of today. Yeah, it is. It's fun, actually. Someone pointed that out to me the other day. I never looked at it that way, but... Uh, but what it gets better? I phoned. <laughs> I phoned the seniors, the nonprofit housing government agency in Toronto. Okay. They had they had like twenty two thousand units. Wow. Throughout Toronto, so I said, "Well, could you send me a list and I can talk to the people there and I'll I'll drop these off to those people." And I had twenty two thousand printed, bundled them up. He he sent me the Toronto housing list of the buildings. 200 units, 400 units, 300, like whatever. I bundled it, labeled it. My uh, An engineer buddy of mine lent me his Toyota. I went around and delivered it. I'd come in. Anybody come to the door and I said, I talked to your head office. I'm just going to leave these in your lobby. And I was lying, actually. <laughs> I, I, probably, that's probably the first time I actually said that in my life. But Forgiveness is easier than permission. Yeah, exactly right. And so when I talked to them, told, oh, that's really neat. You know, they said, yeah, and we'll send you the list of places. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember the conversation, but I'm sure anybody in that position would have said, well, send it to me first, and I'll... Yeah. So I didn't. I just had the addresses. I went there. I delivered to all 190,000 people. Uh, and in their lobbies, I left it in their lobbies and got permission to. And then they called me and they said, Well, I thought you were going to. I said, Well, I, I checked it with the doctor who's the foremost authority in Canada and it's seniors there. Why would I check with you? And they were a little, they were a little cheesy with their answer, but they said, oh, Okay, Mr. Dammit, the only reason I'm asking is because we've had a number of people that don't like reading that call us. I said, Well, that was inevitable. You know that. And so, uh, I, hey, look, not everyone wants to be confronted about their drinking patterns. And it's not my job to do it. It wasn't intended to do that. It was to be information. So, if the time does come. Look, look, 
here, here we are. What, what year is this? 2000 and, uh, <laughs> yeah, This 20. is 30 years later 30, almost. Right. But I get that when I post on Facebook. Yeah, I bet. Right? That, yeah, yeah. That's the current version yeah, of yeah. what you're describing. I put stuff on our community page talking about parenting and yeah. uh, you know different things. And some people take it very personally and very critically that I'm yeah, speaking I did to when them. Yeah, I did. When I first started reading your stuff, I did. them. Yeah. And that I'm, they're feeling shamed. I'm not shaming. They're, sometimes it's like a Rorschach, what you post. Yeah, yeah. People read into it. Yeah, yeah, here, look at the blots and see. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, Let me, they're reading what do you into see? That. <clears throat> so even still, some folks may say, hey, that's not me. Why? If it's not you, then it's not like, there's nothing to read it. Like, that's yeah, I mean, you I'm, making that connection. And then objection, yeah. uh, objecting. To the connection you are making and all i can say is you know oh, okay sorry my apologies if well I is this about you and you, you say no i'm not like this then it's not about you so what, what do you care but but the objection that tells you it's yeah objection. yeah it's touched a nerve there somewhere and uh sorry sorry that that triggered something yeah and uh you know I yeah know, I'll, I'll take that i have a well, one question i gotta ask you particularly with your what you do for a living how did you like the movie, What About Bob? Ha, ha, ha. Wasn't that an amazing movie? First of all, uh, that movie was either in the 80s or yeah, early Yeah, I remember. 90s. Yeah, yeah. And so that's when I would have seen it. Yeah. And now you're stretching my... Uh, Imagination. Your that's, memory. That's right. Which, which uh, you know, is about that long these days. Uh, first of all, I, I like uh, the main character. What the hell is his Richard name? Richard Dreyfuss and, uh, like and the comedian... <coughs> Oh, Bill Murray. Thanks. Like his whole That's right. so demeanor put, in that whole... To put the, those two together is a stroke of genius. Yeah. Right? And, and for like, it, I'm Bob, you know? Who yeah, you yeah. Think? Oh, you mean you're strapping <laughs> all this dynamite on me? It's therapy, right? And then he's looking at optimistically at everything that happens. So being in the profession, I got to look on myself. Yeah, right? yeah. And see the humor in that as well. Yeah. I, I enjoy that humor. What can yeah, I tell that, you? That was <laughs> hilarious, that movie. I just, I always, I always felt like Bob, you know? <laughs> I hope so, God. Yeah, well, you're welcome to stalk me. <laughs> yeah, I'll start stalking you. That'd be hilarious. Yeah, you don't run me, I know it. The, um, so, um, the pandemic, I guess, uh, getting it back to where the pandemic. All of this connects for me. Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, my it's, life is a, just a thread. I, and, it, and it connects in that um, this is very triggering for people. Yeah. They go back to <coughs> previous traumas uh, with what is happening uh, fears or shame or concerns or worries or misperceptions uh, they're elevated now yeah well and my glossy way of looking at everything in a way I like to look my my philosophy in life as it seems to have evolved I don't know but it uh, is that people are inherently good. I agree. Okay, so then, and so when you look at what's happened during the pandemic, 99% have just stepped up, excuse me, let me get out of the way here, go ahead. Like, Absolutely. And, did you uh, see my uh, pandemic song? Hang on, no I didn't. But really? What I was going to say is, that 1% can be very noisy. Yeah. And so that 1% can give an impression Yeah. that it is horrendous out there horrendous more than the majority um families are, are sorting out their systems for out of concern for one another citizens are doing the same like right across the board people are stepping up yeah overall people are stepping up so that takes us to the next level yeah mark zuckerberg there's an algorithm algorithms i wrote a story in 1995 and uh, this is a long story. I shouldn't tell you, but the this writer, so he was a husband. He was a, like a, who never was, and so all of a sudden he, you know, in a drunken stupor, over the course of a weekend, he writes this incredible novel on his computer. So then over over the next year or so, he gets like famous, and his agent he sends it to his agent. And he said, "You didn't write this. Come on, what the hell?" He said, "No, no, I wrote it on the weekend. I you know come into my own here, whatever." And so after he gets rich and famous, writes two or three more. He's sitting there, you know, enjoying a toddy, and some words appear on the computer. 
And it says, uh, we need to talk. And he goes, who the hell is this? He said, well, you don't really need to know, but we need to talk. And he said, no, no, no. get lost. Like, what? He said, okay, I am uh, a force that's developed within the framework of the internet and the interconnections of everybody. And what happens is I need your help to make some connections so that I can pursue my... And he goes, get lost. I said, okay, get lost. This is... I've just transferred two billion dollars of Shell Oil's money into your bank account and notified the police and they're coming down the street right now because of all the connections that the algorithms have, they can do that. Oh, artificial intelligence. So you hear the police coming down, you hear them coming up the stairwell and then he says, do you want me to send them away? And yeah, yeah, send them away, I'll do anything you need. So, and then you hear the sergeant at the top of the stairs and it crackles, okay, stand down, stand down, it's a false alarm. And then the computer goes on to tell him, okay, because of the interactions of all mankind, I've developed an algorithm which represents whatever the will, whatever the will of the mankind in general is. Mm. I didn't know, and then it was. I didn't know when I wrote it in '95. It was algorithms. I just knew that. I always believed that those algorithms that develop will be good because it's people. Everybody's involved. There's not a bunch of bad people over here running it. Nobody has any say in it. It's just it'll take the collective, whatever the collective psyche of mankind is. Those algorithms will develop based on that, so they'll be good. And then you'll just have a corporation president that wants to go to Africa and devastate a couple of villages so that he can do whatever he wants to do. And the algorithm's going to say, no, actually, you're not going to do that. But let me tell you what. Why don't you do this? The village will prosper, and you'll make not as much, but you'll... And that's what's going to happen. Let me know now what you want to do. And nobody will know, like this algorithm, it'll just exist. And all of a sudden, uh, the woes of the world were right. That's what the story I wrote anyway in uh, in '95. Eh? You were a prophet. I don't know. But no, I just uh, it just occurred to me that uh, when I when I started working on the internet, and then the interconnections of everybody, that uh, they were already talking about artificial intelligence in those days. Sure. They were looking down the road what would come of it, and they, they were talking about robots that would develop on their own and take over or whatever. But like there's always been theories about that stuff. Yeah. So when that, so I just wrote that story, and now, actually, I believe, I want to believe Mark Zuckerberg wants that to happen. Like the good stuff to come out of this, and, and you know, you're on the internet, and I'm on the internet. A lot, a lot of good people. I mean, all families and everything. Families are connected uh, more so than they've probably ever been in, like extended families, than ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the whatever algorithms come out of it gonna, are going to have to be the collective. Unless they have some way of adjusting that, but I don't believe they do. They, whatever, whatever the collective good is, intent, is what's going to happen. And uh, so, I don't think it's something to be afraid of. Anyway, that's. Don't ask me how I get into that. But. <laughs> we can go there. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. No, I'm not either. And um, this is not something I typically put my mind to. Mm. <clears throat> I do think there are, you know, those folks in the world who've grown up and are narcissistic, self-absorbed. It's all about them, grandiose. Yeah. Uh, me, my way, and that's the only way. And uh, some of these people are remarkably influential for, not for good, but for yeah, bad. Evil. Evil. Yeah. And uh, and I do think they can influence the internet. In bad ways so even when we look at what's going down with Facebook and is there Russian interference and the like yeah this is nefarious interference oh 100% and uh, and it I is don't know the what log logarithm I can't even algorithms, say yeah. algorithms uh, that can steer who gets what information for what we know this and people are trying to hold Mark Zuckerberg uh, responsible responsible yep. in a in a in a way that isn't just in a way where evil can be kept in better check right the, you know we're we're saying that and so you know depending on what you ascribe to on Facebook and what I ascribe to we're getting <coughs> different well oh, definitely which which can be divisive the, is not candy. The ones I is, is divisive. The ones I don't <laughs> like are the ones that where you get a story and it's liberals telling a nasty story about conservatives. 
Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Depending upon what your bent is. If they think that you're not a liberal and, the, and you should be, then they're sending you... I'm a pinko, fascist, left-wing, oh, you, everyone you been, should have for free. You... I'm that guy. You listened to my song, didn't you? <laughs> Stick it where the sun don't shine. You didn't get that? Call me pinko, leftist, fraggle, lost my label, oh, what a draggle. Yeah, that's my Stick it where the sun don't shine song. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah. we, uh, we're alike. So, so, you know, and... I, I also see the other side of it, fascist, um, you know, stormtrooping Nazis. We've had a wonderful, I believe, historically, government situation in Canada for years and years, and, it, and where the liberals can't wait to spend so much money, and the conservatives kind of keep them in line, and the, and the pendulum swing. Yeah, the pendulum swings. <clears throat> and, and, it, and it's a wonderful... The swing, for me, it is getting too further. far and further well, you know divided it, it, it divisive used, it used to swing within that range now yeah. it's swinging within this range where neither is good well even and, and the degree to which we can live our lives here and be more peaceful people's needs get met we can help people out Cretchen that's where I want to live Cretchen one of the longest standing liberals in history cut the government employee employee by 20% and just one day, got to trim the fat. I uh, he's like the best, eh? And uh, I like uh, Cratchit. Oh, I loved him, and he, uh, he he's a CEO. Yeah, every portfolio he ever took over, he just. Let me tell you what I like about Cratchit, because this is not about politics. What mm -hmm. I like about him, because uh, I use him as uh, a role model for many of the folks that I work with. Right. And the thing I like about him is that he was kind of Teflon. Many folks today, they're not Teflon. Things, here we are by a little waterway, we hear the boats going by. This is a lovely place to be. Yeah, it is. Oh, no, it's good. It was beautiful here. But Cretchen, he was known as the Teflon man. That yep. nothing stuck to him. For me, that's about setting boundaries. And I love that he had that. So. You know, it's every... Um, An amazing sense of humor, too, eh? Every newscaster's dream to ignite the politician, because then their sound bit bite goes of across course. Canada with their of byline. Course. So there's there's the, the newscaster. Prime Minister Cretchen, the right honorable member of the opposition, says you're this and you're yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. How do you respond to these charges? Yeah, yeah. And Cretchen, with his accent, I do it yeah, a little yeah. bit, but not so well, but... He says, well, some people say this about me, and other people say that about me. People say this and that about me. <laughs> you know, I heard him being interviewed. He was, and, and I want, you know, some people, yeah, yeah. they're too thin-skinned. Yeah, he and, just... And I don't say that, again, to be critical, but they let things get in, and it hurts them, and they, they you know... Yeah. They, they don't have that boundary to manage negative inputs. Sure. And so I just, I just love that image. He was well grounded in his own self, his own. Yeah. I seen him interviewed, and he was talking about when he took his daughter to England with him. <clears throat> We're gonna go to the Buckingham Palace. See what kind of a chat they have over there, you know? Like he, he just. He just had it. He's just the a really man from showing again. Yeah, go to see what kind of a shack the queen lives in. You know, like he, uh, he just was a really yeah. decent guy. I just loved him to death. Decent guy. Whether I didn't agree with everything he did, but hell no, uh, that would make me more nervous. Hell no. He was a politician. He yep. was, he him, and, was, him and Trudeau started out together, and they uh, they, they knew how to manipulate. I've been they picking on I've, I've been picking on Justin for about three years, yeah. and I had to uh, I, I I made a commitment to stop doing that because since the pandemic hit, they stepped up. Yeah, party's over. I'm I'm not getting into it anymore about that stuff and. Uh, my pandemic song i'll send it to you because it says right, right in there a crazy thing happened even the politicians agreed they set their differences aside and took care of everybody's needs that's one of the lyrics of the song right and to, you know what that's canadian that's at ca the end of the day the song says it's, we're canadians that's what we do at the end of yeah, the day yeah i'll send it to you for me yeah that's canadian yeah of course that is canadian and i, and I, I don't you've probably heard me rail against us going down that american slope oh. I hate every time when I see something where somebody makes a point out of something that means nothing and has no purpose except for to make the other per side look bad. Yeah. The one who's saying it is the one I look at. Yeah. And, 
you know, for me, everyone says, oh, I don't like Justin, and they make it personal, or I don't like Harper, and they make it personal. Yeah. My view is all politicians are born human. Yeah. I, I'm born human. Lord knows, plenty of mistakes in my portfolio. Yeah. So I worry less, to most extent, about the person, unless they're truly abominable. But I worry less about the person, and I worry more about the policies. People know me. My tagline is, when it comes to politics, I want compassion, inclusion, and concern for the environment. Yeah, for sure. Those are, those are my three principles. My take on Justin Trudeau <coughs> has always been, um, like his dad had core beliefs, right to his yeah. very core. And when he told it to go after yourself, there was no apology coming. He knew why he said it. Fuddle battle. Yeah. So, uh, and I thought, I, I believe that Justin lacks core beliefs to some degree. And so every day he's saying whatever you have to say every day. I don't mean he's a bad person. I mean, and he... He's, and he, not, look, he's not his father. No. And no, and I don't mean it in the sense that he should be. Truly privileged. Yes. And so he doesn't have at the core... That, that whole that yeah. ideals and mm, principles and hardships. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, hey, they had hardships, you know. Yeah, yeah. you know he. Well, he had that. He, had, he lost his brother. He, he, you know, so, so I, I want to be careful not I, to undermine some of the life experience. He an ultra intelligent guy who tends to be shallow every day, like with his like to say whatever he has to say. But if you if you track what he's done since he's been there, he's always trying to do the right thing. Yeah, and so I, I believe that. And I think people around him sometimes take advantage of of that and then take it too far. Yeah. And, and look, I I'm a dark, died in the wall liberal. Yeah. But I can certainly look at this government and say, oh, why did you do that again? Yeah. Like why that whole we that? thing, like the the the. Like come on. Anybody could see from 400 yards. This will not look good. Um, on. Yeah, just back out. <clears throat> yeah. I posted and, and, that. I, and if you tell me you can't see that, that's even more troublesome. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But again, I'm coming down to the policies because I will take issues with every politician around them personally in some of the decisions. Yeah. But overall, is it compassion, inclusion, and concern for the environment? Yeah, he is. And uh, like when it comes to all of that stuff. So I, I don't have any... Um, I just decide... I. I I uh, <laughs> I liken him to a psychopath, to be honest with you. The, the way he just always says what's okay. like, but and but that was just taking that whole thing too far. I would always qualify it and so, and so on and so on, and he does good things and all the rest of it. But when the pandemic hit, and they stepped up, and everybody Look, got. How do you feel about him? I feel about Doug Ford. Yeah. And I, you know what? Um, I don't think much of the man on a personal level. Having said that, I yeah. argue about his politics. Yeah. Sin, okay. Yeah. And you got to know, I do not like his politics. I do not come from a conservative uh, right. uh, place. However, by the time March break came along, yeah. he got the pandemic. Like, like he understood it. Yep. And I've been happy overall with his management of it. Yeah. We're now in a place where I too worry about him using the pandemic as a shield to get through other legislation both sides i'm like oh. and, and i'm coming back to the policy yeah and now i'm starting to see more policy i don't like right. policy that's underfunding uh, education underfunding health care autism is one that uh underfunding autism yeah uh we can't leave that to the free marketplace because that's the free marketplace can't make money on it so they don't care I, w I ran into a mother one day at the post office. We were talking, and uh, autism is a, s a subject matter that I've, I've I wanted to look into. I've read some stuff on it, and I wanted to do a song about it, but I couldn't do it justice. You know, I I, I roll stuff around in my head for months sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I had some ambient sound people who were doing some stuff for me in Cuba that uh, that would might go with that whole uh, situation. Mm -hmm. But right at the time that I met this mother, the point is she's a mother of an autistic child and she's very active in the whole funding and and it was right at the time when the Ford government slashed. Right across Just the board. Slashed. Yeah, yeah, like uh and at the time I didn't have time to look into it enough to determine for my own self personally. 
wh was what they're saying exaggerate? Were they exaggerating, or did he actually do that? Was there stuff that could have been cut? Because the, the liberals tend to just go inclusion, right? Concern for the environment, right? And and include everybody in the conversation until you yeah. get and take a take a consensus. <laughs> Look, I'm I'm a big supporter of public education. I'm yeah, a big supporter of educational assistance in particular. Yeah, in in the school and in, from the educational side, they're at the bottom of the ladder. Right. Now, hey, we also have custodial services. We have, you know, many other services right. that don't get their fair due. But in terms of being in the classroom, uh, the educational assistants, they're the ones who are toe-to-toe -to -toe with kids with autism. The assistants, I'm telling you. They're and they're underfunded. They're undervalued. They're going, they were going in with PPE yeah. long before we ever used that term. Their PPE were um, uh, Kevlar. Kevlar. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, but they no. were wearing Kevlar because they're working with kids who hit, pinch, grab, slap, scrape, poke. Uh, and so to be sitting side by side, they would literally be protected in, in body armor. Yeah. Now, you, you hear Kevlar, you think of the SWAT team. My son was... Um... This is what it takes sometimes to sit beside a child who... Who may act out violently we're talking about return to school what about those students yeah what about, about those that serve them you know in 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 my chatting with literally look at me i'm getting agitated I'm getting, <laughs> uh, yeah. calm out. down Gary. <laughs> but it's gonna work they're, out they're they're not being consulted in terms of their role yeah and what hi puppy and what they need hi. to facilitate here. Good dog. Come closer. Uh, this is the therapy dial. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I get therapy just looking at it. I miss my dogs. They, yeah. But they're happy where they are. They're on a big farm and but I travel we, too much. And we were talking about the conservative government. Yeah. You need to consult the frontline workers if you're going to put a program in place that meets the needs of these students. Yeah. If you don't consult them, you don't know what you are setting your program up. Four. Yeah, yeah. And so far that hasn't happened. And here we are mid July. We used to have a, a September return. We used to have um well for my when my son was young. He uh he was like me, couldn't settle down. And uh, IQ off the chart, but he couldn't settle down. You know, yeah. he uh smart kid. So so he had a spat teacher, whatever the hell they used to call them so that's an assistant that comes in okay. and once a week or twice a week, two days a week or three, whatever, and uh, work with them. And uh, she had two or three that she would work with in mm -hmm. separate. And uh, he had that all through grade school. And uh, he, he got his grade 12. And, and uh, I don't know, I know his whole experience of school was way, let me shut this off, sorry. Sure. My whole, ex his whole experience of school would have been way different if he didn't have that. Avenue because he would have had nobody there to understand him and and make the connection with him and uh, and now with kids going back to school and you know we talked about the pandemic we talked about your yep. little ones my grandkids yep. needing that time to warm up again yep. it's going to be weird for these kids for a half a year being told no don't touch no don't go get close yep. what do they do? I've missed my teacher I want to run up to them yeah. what does the teacher do with that how do you manage the child in that circumstance uh, I, I miss my little buddies am I allowed to hug my little like try telling a three year old not to hug a three year old yeah so these are things that need more discussion these are things that need more patience these are things that need more adults in the environment not less let me tell you, I one did have one burning question that yeah. I wanted to ask you today, especially since this pandemic started. I I live alone. I used to hug my grandkids every day, go to Bailey's every Wednesday night, a couple of things, you know, uh, chat every day with my guys in the house or on the job site. Yeah, you're a social guy. I can't do any of that, and for three months now, 
I'm left to whatever resources I have in my head, and that's not pretty. I got to tell you. <laughs> well, you do. You. We've talked. I know that those resources in your head could be saying a whole bunch of. Well, yeah, things. you know what I mean. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I, this. I get, what you're I get this close to going around, like around the bend. Yeah. At yeah, times, yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean, I'm not going there. I don't think, but uh, it's horrendous. I uh, some days I'm sitting there at night and I'm thinking. I, I never think like extremely bad thoughts or negative thoughts or uh, or anything like I, I don't anything extreme, but I do think Jesus, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life here. And then I start going down the negative aspects of being alone, as opposed to the positive aspect. And there's lots of them, but sometimes it's hard to look at them. You know, I don't know if that makes any sense. It, it makes total sense. My mother who has her wits about her at yeah. 96 oh, yeah. years of age. Yeah, I've seen her. She still drives. Yeah, really? <laughs> God <laughs> love her. They gave her her license. Yeah. Hey, she's not going on the 400 highways. She's yeah. going in the community. And yep. she's she has enough insight to know when and when not. Yeah. Okay, so she's self-managing. Yeah. But she's living this isolated life because at 96, this is the last thing that she wants to get. Yeah. And... You know, so I experience through her as well, just what you're telling me. Yeah. It drives you stir crazy. She's oh. a very social person. Uh, so I do a lot of reaching out. I reach, uh, or I call it reaching in, actually. I'm reaching into her. Yeah. Uh, I'm phoning uh, daily. Yeah. And there's the odd day, you know, twice a day. She's always been fine or mostly fine. Yeah. But I think it's because I keep reaching in. Hey. Yeah. How are you? Have How the conversation you? and so the language I use is to get through this, we have to reach into others. Yeah, one on. Uh, I, so, I if so I didn't have that avenue, I would I'm be making that um, my thing with a number of friends that I'm just checking in on, yeah. so that they have the connection. I'm encouraging people reach out. Yeah. Reach out, like. Get out of your place, or you know, we talked about Zoom. I don't know if it was before we started. Yeah, we. I, I said <coughs> Zoom with people. Get that connection, uh, and I also talk about reach across. Yeah. So you could be uh, a couple, uh, you know, marital or, or yeah, yeah. living together, where you need to check in with each other. How are you reaching across? How are you? So even uh, between Arlene and I, my wife and I. We wake up in the morning and we say, how are you? Yeah. And we mean it ever so sincerely. It, yeah, it's yeah. not that casual throwaway. It's, how are you? And, we, you know, how did you sleep last night? Yeah. I want to know how my wife slept. She wants to, because that will give a clue as to our mood for the day. Do we need to Yeah, where are we at? Other. Yeah. So that reaching across and encouraging people within the family unit, who, yeah. whoever's in your that, that smallest bubble yeah. with you, uh, reach in and reach out. Yeah, I talk to my son uh, daily. I talked to my daughter last night. I, I don't talk to her as much because her and I have a different relationship than me and my son. Um, she's like uh, high end uh, at the region. So mm -hmm. she's had, she has a really fairly, really busy life and really busy with the kids. And so we just don't make the same connection that I do with my son. Love her to death. She loves me to death. And we chat. And then uh, about once in a blue moon, I phone and say, I'm coming to dinner. What do you want me to cook? You know? And uh, so then she says, I love okay. watching her cooking, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, I love to cook as well. Yeah. And I go, shit, now there's a guy I can get behind. Like, like he's my kind of guy. He loves his food and he loves preparing it. And he likes making it for You know, people. if I'm not making it for people, I don't even feel like cooking. Like if I'm not making a meal that a few people are going to eat, I, so that's what I do. I make it. That's my way of reaching out. It's awesome. And you feed the body. The same as that song, you Feeds feed the, soul. the Soul. Yeah, so I mean, that's, yeah, I, I, I enjoy that. But so, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Um, it is such an issue for many people, that sense of isolation. Yeah, it is. Like for me, I'm, I'm coping with it and dealing with it. And then, but not like, loving it. Not loving it. And, and, my, and my life before the pandemic was already there. Like I was already, you know, live alone. I've been living alone for four years. Uh, Tina used to tell me, my ex-wife Tina, the one that left me four years ago. And uh, I want to categorically state while I'm talking about her, 
decent woman, decent wife, decent mother. We were at the end of our tenure. And, uh, you reached the best before date, did you? We reached, we reached the best before date, and we've all landed on our feet. Jessica, okay. my, our step, my stepdaughter, just finished border security school. We talk once in a while. And, and uh, actually, my music, I, uh, I always send it to Tina. We've never talked since she left because she's just not that type. She's a type to go that way. Mm. And what's back there is back there. She does not go back there. That's just she's like that. And uh, and if that's what she needs to do to get on with her life, that's fine. But I send her my music. And some stuff has happened with Jessica over the years where I've said, you know, I'm proud of how you dealt with that, you know, and so on. And so she said thank you. And so we've had that. But beyond that, so anyway, I've been alone for four years. But the reason Tina come up is because she used to say you're going to grow old alone. When we were in an argument, that was her shot. You know, so, and now, for a while, when I was, uh, started doing all that, I just started doing this music since she left, eh? And so, uh, I was thinking, yeah, I'm going to grow alone, and I'm kind of enjoying it. You know, I'm getting all kinds of stuff done, but this pandemic has just made it hell to try and... Look at all these geese coming down here. Holy doodle. Now, let's see if I can... Uh... And yeah, yeah. Catch the scene from the gazebo. This is an amazing spot. You know, I'm going to edit this into about three sections and, for, and release it 20 minutes a shot or something. Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because people will watch it if it's 15 or 20 minutes. If it's an hour, it'll never get looked at. Yeah. So, uh, so just oh, fish are jumping and everything. So we're we're at 51 minutes. Summertime and the living is easy. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. Jumping and the weather is fine. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, there you go. We're gonna have to get a ukulele in here. Did you see my Sam Fico song I did two weeks ago? Uh, I know you're busy. I, I no, I get it, one hundred percent. And I, I gotta tell you, um, I have sixteen thousand followers on my professional Facebook page. Oh, really? And between that and my regular Facebook page and. 22,000 followers on LinkedIn. People send me videos and things to watch and whatnot yeah, yeah. multiple times a day. I, I probably have several hours of content yeah. daily. I don't send it to you because it's there on my page. See. If you have a chance, if you don't, and you don't. I I actually, I, I, yeah. don't, I, I shouldn't be saying this, but I do scan everything. Yeah. I don't watch everything, but yeah. I scan to see Okay, what's this, what's this, what's like this? Like you would scan a book or a, a, <laughs> an article about something to and, catch. You know, what, yeah, yeah. But there's no <coughs> way I can follow up on all that. Plus, yeah. I still do have my day job. Yeah, everybody's got to have so, a day job. So so, um, so with, that's my uh, apology. Yeah, uh, well, you don't have to. You, uh, you owe me no but, apology. But you know that I do love it. And I love the style. And I love your voice. And, oh, well, thanks you know, for that's that. That's what I was bringing to my daughter-in-law. Yeah. This morning when I was explaining who, who I'm meeting with. I just posted song number 14 today. I, I started 14 days ago, started posting one a day. Yesterday, I posted uh, my John Prine song. Thank you, John Prine. Because I confirmed with Old Boy Records, that his record label that he started, that he actually heard it before he passed. Which was kind of neat. Wow. Yeah, that was kind of neat. And... Uh, See that song? I, I rolled that around in my head for. I read everything I could read on him. I always knew about him. I always loved his songs and stuff. So I read everything I could read, and then I just I wrote that song rolling around in my head, driving around and stuff. And then John, Connor. your music is your therapy, clearly. Oh you know, yeah, it's, it's creative way, creativity uh, is my outlet, and it's I'm your telling way you, of working through the mud. You should have seen the one I did a month ago. Uh, you'll get a kick out of this. The uh, the guy who did the artist that did the original album cover for you.